After Kasparov's win in Game 9, uh, Smyslov again took the white pieces and, tar and uh, the Tarish was again played, which ended in a 38-move um, draw here. So pretty much Kasparov had started running away, uh, running away with the match. Um, Smyslov had no answer uh, to the dynamic uh, uh, Tarish that Kasparov uh, was playing. Uh, he tried his best, but... Um, Kasparov had all the answers. Game 11. Smyslov again switched up the opening and played Shigorin's defense. This may have surprised Kasparov as this also ended uh, in the draw in 26 moves. This brings us to the game we'll be looking at in this video. Game 12, Smyslov again has the white pieces, and Kasparov has the black pieces. Game started out D4, D5, Knight F3. <clears throat> There's a Tarish again, it's giving Smyslov headaches. C4, E6, C takes, E takes, G3, Knight F6, Bishop G2, Bishop E7. Castle, castle, knight c3, knight c6, and this is the old main line, bishop g5. Um, there's tons, there's tons and tons of um, work in the terrace, like books and stuff. Um, Grandmaster repertoire. Um, I mean, there's all type of, I mean, this this stuff is, uh, you got to put it in work in if you're going to play the terrace. The black pieces. This is one of the main lines, though. Again, one of them. And here, C takes D4 is played, and this is what used to be played definitely back in the early 80s. Another another possibility is C4. I tried the Tarish a few times, and I like playing C4 when given the opportunity. Um, unfortunately, if you're black, is that you don't always get the opportunity to play C4 because there's lines where black, excuse me, where white plays D takes C5 <laughs> early as I think move six. And, and actually, uh, they're very, very uh, critical lines to the variation. But that's another day, another video altogether. So here, the old school C takes D4 was played. Knight takes D4. And just a real basic run through is that black has taken on an isolated pawn, which can be either weak uh, or strong, depending on the other contributing factors in the position. Um, generally, if you have the isolated pawn and, uh, you, you have free piece play. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. All right, so basically, you have, if you have the isolated pawn, uh, you want to have, uh, as much activity as possible. Okay, you need dynamic piece play, uh, to compensate for this potential weakness. Um, the reason is real simple. If you don't have any activity, then white can just simply concentrate his forces on the isolated pawn and win it. Because by nature, the fact this pawn is isolated, right, uh, alone, it must be supported and protected by pieces. Therefore, if your pieces are inactive, right, uh, badly placed, then the, uh, person attacking the isolated pawn will simply just attack the pawn and win the pawn and will be up material and if there's no other um, no nothing mitigating this right no compensation no attack uh, you know <laughs> no um, prospects in the position then you'll just be losing so therefore the person that has a uh, isolated pawn must have some type of compensation and usually this comes in the form of dynamism and free peace play, right? So attacking players, um, you know, throughout history have picked up this opening and have shown and proved that black can play with great uh, vigor. And that's how you have to play with this because you, you, your opponent, you must keep your opponent, uh, you must be, keep your opponent's hands full. Right. So that he can't just bear down and uh, focus on the isolated pawn. You have to give him other things to think about in the position. H6. 
benefits of having an isolated pawn is the free piece play, though. You see how easy it is for uh, black to com complete his development, right? The bishop is not trapped in behind the pawn, usually a pawn on e6, right? In the um, Queen's Gambit decline variation, the bishop can come out. The rooks find easy uh, spots on c8 and d8 usually, sometimes e8. But it's easy to, to place all of, all of the pieces. So here it is, rook e8, a3. Bishop e6, right? Just adding some more protection to that pawn. Knight takes e6, f takes e6. So this strengthens um, white center somewhat. Now, excuse me, black center. Now, there's some, of course, black has some pawn islands. And these are st like static weaknesses. But right now in the middle game, this is a strength to have this pawn center, right? Especially if it's mobile. Now, if white can fix it and stop it where it doesn't move, then it just becomes a big target. So, Black's job here is to mobilize the center. Which means taking control and keeping control of d4 and e4. <clears throat> Queen a4. Rook c8. Rook a d1. Again, this is um, part of Smith's Law's strategy to fi again fix the pawns. Make it very hard for them to... To mobilize the advance by putting a whole bunch of pressure on d4, it makes it very hard for black to uh, d5. It makes it very hard for black to play e5. King h8, king h1, a6. Now black is playing on b5, f4, knight a5, f f5. Excuse me, b5. Queen h4, knight g8, okay, now this is a um, kind of a suspect move by Kasparov, like you really don't want to be playing moves like that, knight g8, and this gives the opponent tempo, so Smyslov plays queen h3, so Smyslov um, with this move is actually, um, he has, he can win this pawn, right, he's threatening just to play this move, um, F takes E6 here. Now, however, here's where the dynamism comes in. Now, Knight C4, attacking the bishop on E3. So you see, E3 is attacked, and B2. So now, White can't just continue on with his plan. Now he has to move a piece away from the center. So there's Bishop C1. There's more dynamism, bishop g5. Now if the bishop captures or something, then b2 is not protected again. So constantly keeping threats in front of uh, white to deal with makes it hard for him to just bear down and concentrate on the pawn weaknesses. f takes e6, right? So he grabs a pawn. So bishop takes c1, rook takes c1, knight e3. Notice again, Kasparov is playing dynamic. He doesn't... He just doesn't play, you know, like a cheap move, like this knight takes, oh, I'm going to get the pawn back, knight takes b2. Because then he'll be in a worse position. Right, he plays a positional move. He plays knight e3. Attacking the rook, bishop. Now Spitzlov plays knight takes d5, parts with the exchange. Let's say if he try to play a move like rook f7, then queen g5 could be played, penetrating the white position, or a move like knight f6. The point is, is that Smyslov didn't wasn't forced to give up the exchange. Again, even at the rook f2. Knight of six, and you have to start, you know, uh, preferring black a little bit. Here, that knight on e3 is very, very, very powerful. All right, knight d5. So Smyslov says, forget that, I'm going to give you the exchange. Because he views the, um, the knight on e3 is more valuable than his rook. So rook takes f1. Rook f8. Knight f4. Threatening, um... Knight g6, knight e7, queen g4, 
G5, bold move by Kasparov, Queen H3, Rook F6, now Knight D3 by Smyslov, no more Rooks for White, King G7, now <clears throat> although um, White has two pawns for the exchange, the problem is, is the quality of the pawns. The pawns are doubled, right? So that's no good. If they were side by side, it'd be a different story. But the pawns are doubled, and the lead pawn is even blockaded by the knight on e7. All right. So now, um, white is basically just down the exchange without compensation. Bishop on f1 is no good, right? It has to be moved back to g2. And those pawns aren't any good. Those pawns are supposed to be compensation for the exchange. Those are no good. Um, what else can we What else can we really say about this position? The only thing White can hope for is to be able to, um, you know, get some type of attack based on the exposed nature of the Black King. But White's King is exposed also, and it's easier for Black to uh, get to White's King. Then it is the other way around. Let's see what happened now. Queen g4. Queen d5. And now e4 was played. A natural looking move, right? <coughs> Excuse me. This is bishop g2. But this fails to rook c1. Now I know some of you are saying, wait a minute. Knight takes c1. Well, then queen d1 check. Now what? Bishop f1. And then queen takes f1 as its mate. That's why I was saying that bishop is no good. It's stuck there on f1. So e4 instead. Queen d4. h4. Smizov is desperate. Trying to undermine the defenses of the black king. Rook f8, just a one move threat. Rook e2. Now queen e3, which uh, threatens, excuse me, um, it protects the pawn on g5. So if h takes g5, this simply h takes g5 can be played. Um, Alright, so, so after queen e3, King g2. Knight g6, h5. Now Kasparov played knight e7. Um, first move I'm looking at is knight e5. And there's a cool trick here. If um, this is actually better because um, a, a knight e this forces matters a little bit. If knight takes e5 here, then we got rook f2 check. King h3, and then you got queen c1. I was looking at rook f4 first, though, with um, with this idea, being able to play that. But knight e7 is clear, right, or clearer, and you go with the clear line. It's winning. You see two winning lines. One is more clear than the other. You take the... The clearest way, even though it might be a little longer. At least you know that way. It's kind of like you're going to a well-known destination and your friend says, Oh, I have a shortcut, but he's not really sure of the way. But the way you're going is well-known, although it might take a little longer. You might have known, learned from experience that it's better just to stick with the way that you know instead of trying to take the shortcut that... You think you know, but you really don't. So after king h2, rook d8. It's real simple stuff going on now. e5. Rook takes d3. Bishop takes d3. And queen d3 just ending ending the matters. Again, um, here Smyslov resigned. Devastating victory. And again, um, this pretty much closed out the match uh, in game... 12 
although there were um you know several games uh played uh, after this so game 13 was a short a short draw another cambridge springs and that was it uh for the match so let's conclude let's conclude that was it for uh, smith Love's run um as a major run, just the fact that he had um, kind of disappeared from those matches for, you know, for a long time. That, you know, those level of matches with that much on the line. And then to return and defeat um, uh, Zoltan Ribley, uh, Robert Hubner. Although it was, uh, he didn't really beat Robert Hubner. It was uh, he won his spot through the, um, the turn of the roulette wheel. Um, which was still one of the weirdest things I've ever heard, you know, deciding the chess candidates, um, placement. Um, but what can we learn from this match? One is that Kasparov, you know, is 20, 20 years old, 21 years old at the time. So just at, you know, just, you know, still, he's not even at his peak. He's still, you know, growing. Uh, Smizlov is older at the time and just could not withstand the the dynamic style the constant pressure and activity of um Kasparov at his age it was just too too overwhelming for him even though he tried to play like dry dry solid positions like Canberra Springs Kasparov found a way to be active even in those positions where it seemed like there was no activity again he beat um Smyslovs all the games he won were End games, except for the very last game that I showed you, where the Queens were still on the board and he resigned. The, all the other games Kasparov won were all end games. So I think that was part of Smith's Law strategy was to play these dry positions, get to the end games. But what happened is even in the end games, Kasparov was still more active, held the two bishops many times. It's a result of, of playing variation like Cambridge Springs. And um, due to um, Smith's Law's passive play, Many times in all of those losses, he always found his pieces very awkwardly placed. He had a good pawn structure, but his pieces would be awkwardly placed. And this awkward piece placement would allow Kasparov to seize open lines, ranks, files, create weak squares, and then ultimately uh, defeat Smyslov. So that concludes our look at the 1984 candidates match between Vasily Smyslov and Gary Kasparov. I hope you liked that. Please uh, subscribe then. Uh, press the like button. Comment. And um, I'll see you on, on the next series.